Okay guys, so this video is going to be looking at the poem The Prodigal by Elizabeth Bishop. Right, so before we get into the poem itself, I want to think about the title of the poem. So the title The Prodigal. Right, so some of you are probably aware of this already, but there's a story in the Bible called The Prodigal Son. What do you think? Do you know anything about this story? Okay, and what do you think the poem may be about based on this title? Okay, so what is the prodigal son about? Okay, it's a biblical reference. And what do you think the poem may be about based on this? Okay, so I'm going to start off. I'm going to read through a section of the story of the prodigal son. So this is a section from uh, the New International Version of the Bible. Uh, the Gospel of Luke, and this just goes into the story. It's a very famous story from the Bible. So, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to the father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild, in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was severe famine, in that whole country and began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even half, even a young goat, so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son, this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you killed a fat of calf for him. My son, said the father said, You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because his brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Okay, so this is the story of the prodigal son. So the prodigal son is the son who has left uh, home. So he, take, he, he asked his father for half his estate. Okay, so the father gives him half the estate, so half the money that he would have inherited when the father passed it away. Uh, the father gives it to him. He goes off and kind of wastes it all on just doing whatever he wants. When he runs out of money, he tries to get a job, but realizes, okay, look, at you know, I, I can't get a good job. I'm going to go back to my father and see if he can give me a better job and ask him to forgive me for what I've done. And when he comes back, the father is so happy to see his son back that he's been, because he's been missing his son, that he has a big celebration about coming back. But the other son, the older brother, is kind of angry that the father never had all celebrations for him. And the father says, if you're always here, I appreciate you and I love you, but I have to celebrate when my son who I had lost comes back to me. Okay? So that essentially is the story of the prod that's the basic story of the prodigal son. Now, based on this story, okay, we want to think about why Bishop might call her poem the prodigal. Okay? So what kind of themes do you think are coming out of this story? If we go back, what might the poem uh, be ba be about based on this title? And um, we would probably think of this idea of redemption. Okay, someone coming back, the idea of pain and suffering in life, because the prodigal son uh, suffered a huge amount when he wasn't with his father. Okay. Uh, forgiveness of the father. Right. There's a few different themes there that we might begin to think about. Okay, But the title is definitely bringing into mind this idea of the son who went out, 
wasted things, had a difficult life, that didn't suffer because it was waste, came back and was welcomed back. And, they, so, and we may want to think about Bishop and her own life and what she suffered through and what kind of uh, obstacles she had to overcome as part of her life. Okay, so quite a few different things you might see in the poem. Alright, well, if we look at the poem itself then, we'll probably go. The brown, enormous odour he lived by was too close, with its breathing and thick hair for him to judge. The floor was rotten, the sty was plastered halfway up with glass smooth dung. Light lashed self righteous above moving snouts, the pig's eyes followed him with a cheerful stare. Even to the sow, all was ate her young, until sickening who leaned to scratch her head. But sometimes, mornings after drinking bouts, he hid the pints behind the two by fours. The sunrise glazed the barnyard mud with red, the burning puddles seemed to reassure, and then he thought he almost might endure his exile yet another year or more. But evening's first star came to warn, the farmer whom he worked for came at dark, to shut the cows and horses in the barn, beneath their overhanging clouds of hay, with pitchforks, faint forked lightning, catching light, safe and companionable as in the ark. The pigs stuck out their little feet and snored. The lantern, like the sun going away, laid on the mud a pacing oriole. Carrying a bucket along a slimy board, he felt the bat some serpent staggering flight, his shuddering insides beyond his control and touching him. But it took him a long time, finally, to make up his mind to go home. Okay, so that is the poem itself. Okay, quite a short poem. Uh, you can see the element of the prodigal son in there, so I'm working with pigs doing this horrible job. Okay, so this is the element of the story where he's working before he goes back to the father, and then at the end, says he finally makes up his mind to go home. So, first impression. Where is the prodigal as described in the first stanza? What language at the beginning of the second stanza tells us that things are changing for the prodigal? And what happens at the end of the poem? Okay, so I'm going to flip back to the poem now in a second. I'm going to suggest reading through it uh, three or four times, really get a good understanding, familiarity with the poem, and be able to come up with answers to those few questions. Okay, so uh, where is probably going to describe the first stanza? So he's in, um, he's working on a farm and he seems to be living amongst the pigs. Okay, he's working and taking care of the pigs and the animals on the farm. Uh, it doesn't seem like a nice place, you can see the colours and everything being described there. Uh, you know, it's a style that he's living in. What language at the beginning of sex tells us things are going to change? Um, and that is the idea of the star rising. Okay, so the first star came to warn, and also it begins with the word but. Okay, so we have kind of a, he at the end of the first stanza he has this resolution that maybe he'll be able to endure a bit longer, but then it starts to put things are going to change. Uh, and then finally what happens at the end of the poem, at the end of the poem he kind of he seems to make up his mind to go home. Okay, so he's made up he's made a decision that he's going to go home to his father, but he doesn't actually leave yet, okay, it's just that he made a decision that he's going to go home. Alright, so if we go into it, we're gonna look at each stanza in a bit more detail. So, stanza one. The brown enormous odour he lived by was too close, with its breathing and thick hair for him to judge. The floor was rotten, the sty was plastered halfway up with glass smooth dung. Light lashed, self-righteous, above moving snouts, the pig's eyes followed him, a cheerful stare, even to the sow who always ate her young, till, sickening, he leaned to scratch her head. Sometimes mornings after drinking bouts, he hid the pints behind the two by fours. The sunrise glazed the barnyard mud with red. The bur burning puddles seemed to reassure. And then he thought he almost might endure his exile yet another year or more. So, questions I want to think about here are how many lines are there in the first stanza? Why might this be important? Uh, what type of image does the poet create of this place? And what emotions is the pod prodigal going through at this time? So, again, pause here for two or three minutes and read through the sounds of it for five seconds. Okay, so you'll notice how many lines there are 14 lines in this stanza. Okay, and there's only 14 lines in the second stanza as well. And we know that if the poem is 14 lines long, we can talk, start thinking, is it a sonnet? Okay, that's one thing we need to consider with this poem. Are we looking at a sonnet 
right? And what, why might it be a song? Is this poem really then about love? Okay, and uh, you know, is that what the father shows to son by section the back? Is this, uh, you know, in the prodigal son, is it a love story? Okay, most people would say yes, it is. Um, and then, you know, we can look at the love here. What is he, is he that he's struggling to accept love? Uh, what type of image does the poem create a place? Place is created as quite a disgusting place, okay? She is quite um, descriptive in how, you know, revolting the place that she's in, that the, the prodigal son is living in, seems to be. So we talk about the glass loop dung up the walls, okay? She talks about the pig who eats her young, okay? It's a very, very harsh and disgusting place. Uh, what emotions are probably going through at the time? He seems to be trying to survive, okay? He is disgusted, but he is in the, um, he's captured by addiction, okay? So you can see that he is so addicted to his alcohol and because he's tied to the the pints behind two by fours, that he is willing to endure this hell in order to be able to keep drinking, okay? So a few notes alongside this. Poet from the start, at the start, poet creates an image of appalling conditions. Okay, there's a focus on a more disgusting element, talk about the odour that he can barely live by, just the dung and the sow that all the her young. Okay, so very much creating appalling, disgusting imagery here. She draws on a number of different senses, okay, so um, this is trying to immerse the reader within it. So we have the imagery, we have the smell, okay, the smell goes across a few times here. We even have then possibly sound of um, you know him is walking through the place. Uh, the prodigal comes across as desperate for companionship from the pigs so the prodigal is lonely here and uh, we know this because he's looking for companionship even from the pigs he leaned to scratch her head. This is the only part, the only being that will show him any kind of sense of love or connection so he's looking for companionship from the pigs but the pigs are self-righteous Right. Light, last, light lashed, self righteous. They seem to think uh, possibly he's bitter that the pigs almost have a better life than he does. You know, they're being served food, the farmer takes care of them at the end of the day, no one's taking care of him. So, is he, does he believe that, is he having, you know, is this an element of his addiction maybe? He sees he's annoyed by the pigs that they seem to think that they're better than him because he serves them. Okay. Is he annoyed by his life? That his life is so bad that you know even pigs have a better life than him. Right? This line then down in the brackets, he hit the pints behind the two by four, and in fact we stopped the drinking. This is very very important because it brings in uh, certain aspects of Bishop's personal life. So we know here that the prodigal has a drinking problem, and we know from our own knowledge of Bishop that she did struggle with alcoholism throughout her life. Okay, and um, so. There's a clear connection here between Bishop's life and Prodigal. So the morning after drinking, Prodigal sees he might be able to continue his life, but when he's drunk, when he's drinking, he can deal with the situation. He can deal with, you know, oh, it's a new day, I have a few drinks, and I can keep going through this. Okay, so um, this is where we get the imagery of him possibly enduring another year or so of this place, right? But this is the viewpoint of an addict, okay? That he is more comfortable in a pig's side with alcohol than the prospect of giving up alcohol, okay? And he procrastinates from the decision he knows is inevitable that he will be, he will have to deal with it. He knows that, okay? He's only going to endure another year or more. Okay, it's just the kind of bartering that we, that we expect from addicts that, oh yeah, I'll just have one more drink. Oh, I'll just stay here a little bit longer and I'll fix it later, I'll fix it later, I'll fix it later. That's what the prodigal keeps saying. But we can see the trap here. And this is probably what Bishop went through, you know, or could have went through, you know, in terms of dealing with her alcoholism, you know, all of making that excuse of I'll deal with it tomorrow, I'll deal with it tomorrow, I'm always putting off and dealing with it later. Okay? It's very much setting up. So in the first stanza, he's very much still caught in the addiction. Uh, these are the disgusting images here. I just uh, just a lot of juxtaposition going on through the stanza, okay. Um, so we have the imagery of you know the the dung and the odor and the it's, uh, Sour rolls, eats her young. But this is contrasted against some beautiful imagery being brought in as well. So if we look at um, the sunrise, uh, you know, and the sunrise glazed apparently, the world with red, that 
even though the barn is covered in dirt and dung and everything like that, there is beauty to it and the prodigal is finding that beauty. So perhaps examining his perspective that he can find you, you, he's able to trick himself into thinking that there is beauty in the place he is and that's not bad perhaps as well that he's tricking himself into not seeing the reality of the situation he's in so this maybe is showing how destitute he is how bad his addiction is that he is willing to make these excuses about the place that he's living um, the coupling of disgusting and beautiful imagery is very typical of bishops we've seen this in the fish we've seen where she described the quite ugly appearance of the fish and she compared it to quite beautiful images. Right? This is a very much a feature we come to expect of Bishop Viking. Okay, so moving on then to the second stanza. But evenings the first star came to warn. The farmer whom he worked for came at dark to shut the cows and horses in the barn beneath their overhanging clouds of hay with pitchforks, faint forked lightnings catching light, safe and companionable as in the ark. The pigs stuck out their little feet and snore. The lantern, like the sun going away, laid on the mud a pacing oreo. Carrying a bucket along a slimy board, he felt the bat's uncertain staggering flight, shuddering insights beyond his control, touching him. But it took him a long while, finally, to make up his mind to go home. So, some questions now to consider with this stanza. What is important about the language in the first line of the second sonnet of the second stanza? Uh, how is the prodigal's life different to that of the animals at night? And why is it important that it took him a long time to go home? Okay, so we want to ask you again to pause here, read through the stanza two or three times, and think about answers to those questions. Okay, so in terms of language in the first line of the Sansa, we've already actually mentioned this earlier on, we have to notice the use of the word but. Okay, this continuation and while he was in the addiction at, in, at the end of the first stanza, there seems to be hope maybe things are going to change here, but he's not going to stay in this situation. We also have the first star, okay, perhaps the star being a symbol of hope as it can often be, but we also see that the night time is coming, okay, that the sun is going away. Okay, so the brightness lays the, the the joy that he gets from alcohol, the you know, supposed joy that he gets from his addiction, um, going away, and now he's kind of seeing life for what his life for what it is. His life is very different to the animals here, and this shows how badly uh, his life has become. In that the animals have someone to take care of them. Okay, the animals seem to repent. The horses and cows are locked away. Look at, especially at the description of the pigs. The pigs stuck out their little feet and snored. A very comfortable, you know, image of you know pigs who are being taken care of. Okay, and very, very, you know, it's almost a little like a cute image there of pigs, you know, comfortable and snoring. Compared to what he's now going to have to deal with, he seems to be, you know, sleeping in the mud outside. It's kind of you know very much living within the dirt outside, while the pigs have a bit of comfort and being taken care of. So his life has gone so far that he's worse off than the farm animals. And why is it important that it took him a long time to go home? Right? This is showing the struggle of addiction, okay? That it's not a simple thing. You can't just, you see people who are addicted, it takes them, it takes a long time, it takes a huge amount of work to find make that decision, right? It is important also here that he just makes the decision to go home. He doesn't go home. It doesn't say he goes home. Right? So there is definitely a bit of ambiguity here, is, is this still just part of his struggle? Has he made a decision to go home tonight, repent tomorrow? You know, is this a cycle that he goes through all the time? Right? Is he still trapped within the addiction? Is when the um, sun comes up, is he going to be able to endure, see himself being able to endure another year or more? Okay? But it's a long time, it's definitely showing the struggle here, it's what we really need to be able to look at. Okay? There is a struggle. That he's going through and it's going to uh, you know it's not an easy decision to make okay so we should be able to maybe empathize with him and the difficulty of the life he's currently living All right. so a few notes along this section then we'll start off at the top again by the beginning the so by beginning the second sonnet with the word but she negates the ending of the first stanza the star usually a sign of hope could seem ominous in that it comes to warn okay and suggests that night will be difficult 
perhaps he will not be able to endure another year. Okay, so what the end of the first stanza, he said he will be able to endure another year, but tells us maybe he won't be able to. Uh, Bishop brings in another biblical story here, which talks about the ark, say if his companion is in the ark, perhaps insinuating the life of the animals is as it should be, they have companionship, this may be suggesting that companionship is central to fuller existence and the prodigal lacks this. But what I'm trying to point out there is that, you know, it's not that the, the animals are being treated particularly well, they're just being treated normally as they should be treated, whereas the prodigal is just being treated, his life's not so badly wrong, but this is where, you know, his side that he's being treated so bad, or not being treated in his life as in such an institution. Uh, there is a contrast in the lives of the animals to that of the prodigal. The animals have the farmer to take to care for them and sleep side by side, okay? They're safe and companionable as in the ark, so most of you be aware of the kind of idea of the ark animals going in two by two. That they have companionship, the prodigal doesn't have that, okay? So there's definitely a sense of the addiction being ruining relationships that he can't have true companionship, he can't be truly with someone. You know, he's going to be constantly alone because of the addiction. Okay. So maybe she's coming on her own life there as well. Does the addiction, you know, show that, you know, if someone's truly addicted that they never really be able to have proper connection with someone and proper uh, companionship. Uh, there is contentedness to the existence of the animals. They and that comes across through the pigs they still out a little feet snore. The prodigal doesn't have any of this. He has no companion, he has no happiness really, other than the escape of the drink, which we see doesn't very, really last very long for him. Uh, when the light of the farmer's lantern is gone, the animals are shut away, uh, shut away the reality of the situation hits prodigal. Okay, when, the, when he can't, when he's not busy with the animals, and he's left alone, and the reality of the situation is hitting him, he can no longer uh, ignore the world he's in, that he's walking along the slime board, the bats flying overhead, and his thoughts go are beyond his control, um, and this forces him to look at the situation. He can't control what he's thinking. Okay, his thoughts just kind of go off on their own, and he realizes how bad the situation is. There is relief at the end of the poem when the prodigal makes up his mind to go home. However, we know his resolve is not that strong, and there is a worry that he might still be held by his addiction. Okay, so it's very important that he doesn't go home. He decides to go home. But we do, we may worry about his ability to actually act upon that. Is he just going to go back to drinking the next morning? It's important to note that it takes him a long time. It comes to a decision which reflects the huge difficulties inherent in dealing with a problem such as alcoholism. And Bishop had personal experience with addiction and also struggled with this concept of both companionship and home. Okay, so remember when we looked at her life, she never really had a home. So he goes home. Where does she go? Does she have a home to go to? She struggles with the idea of being able to go home. And perhaps there's a connection there with her alcoholism. And that, you know, where can she go if she gives up the alcohol, if she gives up her own addiction? Okay, and that's just adding another realm of difficulty to what she went through. Okay, so, awful lot going on in this home, okay? There's a huge amount of reading and we're going to have to spend a good bit of time on this home, okay? A few more things just to add. The themes of the poem are alcoholism, destitution, hope, okay, there is the hope of, you know, there's always hope to get past it, even if he's in, in dealing with alcohol, within with addiction and alcoholism, it's in a destitute situation, there's hope to come back. There is redemption by coming back, by making that decision and fighting against difficulties of the addiction that you, do, you can redeem yourself. And there's definitely a lot of personal reflection, just uh, commenting on her own personal journey in life. Uh, there are numerous points of contrast between light and dark throughout the poem. The poem creates a powerful atmosphere and makes us question our perceptions of the world and consider other people's points of view. There are numerous religious images, okay, so you have to talk about the, the, uh, the imagery of light and dark. You should be able to talk about the numerous religious imagery, especially the idea of the prodigal son story. Uh, drawing on the Bible helps Bishop to make her, the point she's trying to make, make the story very seem relatable. Okay, and um, when you're talking about the story of the prodigal son from the Bible for Christians, this is very much a story of forgiveness. And so I bring that up, maybe she's asking her audience to think about forgiveness and think about the nature of their forgiveness. Because often addicts do have a very strong stigma against them and you know aren't easily forgiven. Perhaps she's using this to try and get her audience into a frame of mind where they're ready to think about forgiveness. 
the contrast and language are very notable here. It might be a good idea to highlight positive words in one color and the negative words in a different color, and you just see how prevalent those contrasts are, that the positive, negative contrast positive all the way through home. Okay. Uh, poem is written in two sonnets. The fine lines of poem, however, do not make a true rhyme, perhaps reflecting the discord in the mind of the prodigal. So it's not neat, it's not organized, it's not perfectly structured, and that perhaps is part of resembling the struggle of addiction, that things can't be structured, things can't follow a straight, you know, set line. Everyone's kind of got their own personal experience, and that actually maybe it's not the end of the world that you know that people are faltering. Right? That's not the important thing here, that she doesn't follow the set structure of exactly what is supposed to be done in the sonnet. Perhaps addicts need to find their own structure out of their addiction. Okay. Um, so a few tasks then for today. I want you to think about which one task, sorry. I want you to write a monologue in the character of the prodigal reflecting on your situ reflecting on your situation and your plan to return home. Okay, so you're writing in the first person, okay, you're telling the story, you're writing the thoughts and mind and ideas of the of the part of the song, so you're writing as that character. Okay, you want to include some details from the poem, you want to consider what would he be thinking in his mind, struggle with alcoholism, you know, think that, oh, I want to go home for this reason, but I can't go home because this will happen. Okay, and have that bit of kind of debate within the mind of prodigal. Imagine the life of the prodigal prior to the situation. Okay, so you'd be in issues of, oh, if I was home, I'd be having this and this again, and I'd bring in the idea of the older son, the older brother. Okay, what might the prodigal expect from his family on returning home? And think about, look back at the biblical story we looked at, because it gives you some things there. Okay, um, I'm looking for about two A4 pages here. Plan the structure appropriately. Okay, you know, think about this. What I'm looking for you to do here is really get into the mind of or trying to empathize with the prodigal, with the addict addiction, which will help you then to, be able to kind of uh, understand Bishop as a poet as well. Okay, so that's everything.